Sometimes it's fairly easy to stand up in front of a congregation and and talk about certain things that God says is sinful and everyone just simply agree. And then we, we walk out of here just reassured that certain thoughts and, and ideas that we had were correct. But there's another aspect of preaching and teaching that we need to take under consideration, another serious role and responsibility that not only that I have, but that you have as well in 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 2, the young evangelist Timothy was told to commit the things that he has received from uh, from the Apostle Paul to faithful people that they may go out and teach others as well. And, And so the idea is that not only are we reassured of certain ideas and thoughts that we have as far as what is right and what is wrong, but that we are equipped, Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 11 and 12, we are equipped for the work of going out and teaching others as well. We could stand up and talk about a subject like marriage and talk about the subject of, of gay marriage and homosexuality and just simply go to the Scripture say it's wrong and we could walk out of here, I thought it was wrong, I knew it was wrong. But then we run into individuals who are out there trying to justify it and making arguments even from a a supposedly biblical perspective. And then we're like, but it it just we I just thought it was wrong. And then we don't we're not aware of some of the arguments that are made or how to address some of those arguments or answer some of those arguments. And so what I'd like to do today is actually kind of go through a little bit of that because as we noticed last week, when we talked about the, 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 denominational, uh, the, the denominations following the devil's playbook, and, and we looked at several denominations and the progress, progression that they made uh, it going from, from bad to worse, we mentioned the Methodists, for example, who have uh, come out here in the past couple of years to say that words like male and female, words like traditional marriage is considered by them as harmful language. In 2020, when all the riots and you had the BLM organization that was coming out and attacking God and God's plan for marriage and, and openly seeking to, uh, to disrupt or destroy the biblical family unit, they had a, a statement which they still uh, uh, abide by in their thinking, in their mindset, which says that we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirements. And they go on to say by supporting each other as... Uh, uh, as an extended family and village that collectively cares for one another to the extent that mothers and parents and children are comfortable. And then they also go on to say that we foster a queer affirming a fear uh, confirming uh, network now you look at that and you think what is that all about what they're saying is we think that that the 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 biblical family unit it is something that we deny. We deny God. We deny His plan altogether. We look at this and say that this is something that man has come up with and not God. And they make certain arguments even from the Scriptures. And so this is what we are facing. This is the attack that is happening against 
those who would look to the Word of God, the inspired text of King Jesus, to say this is God's plan and this is what we should be following and this is what we are preaching. And there are other arguments that are being made, not only just simply denying God, but sometimes they actually go to the Word of God and they'll say, you know, Jesus never condemned homosexual marriage. Jesus never even talked about gay marriage in the Gospels. And many of you would probably go through and look and and think, well, Surely he did. Surely something is said and something is condemned. And some might walk away with the thought and the idea that, well, maybe he didn't. But I want to show you the fallacy of that argument because sometimes there is more said in silence than there is in in actually what is revealed. What is not said is sometimes is more powerful than what is said. And, and by looking at what has been revealed, it can eliminate everything else without saying anything about it. Matthew chapter 19, for example. In Matthew chapter 19, in verses 4 through 6, remember Jesus has just been asked the question, And while we're not going to get into all the ins and outs of the uh, divorce arguments that are are made, He is asked the question in verse 3, Is it lawful to divorce for just any cause? For any reason? And in essence, Jesus answers that question and says, No, it isn't. And so the idea of divorce as a rule is a sin. Is there an exception given? Yes. But as a rule, it is sinful. And in fact, without exception, every time a divorce takes place, sin is involved. Now I understand the exception, we're not getting into all of that this morning, but what we do find is Jesus answering the question and saying no. But notice what He says in that response to, is it lawful to divorce? He says, have you not read that He who made them in the beginning made them male and female. For this cause a man should leave his father and mother. Now let's stop there for just a minute. In the beginning He made them male and female. God made them male and female. For this cause a man should leave his father and mother. Again, notice what he said. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. A man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That they shall no longer be two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. He goes on to explain when they ask the question, what about Moses? From the beginning... That was not so. And so when you look at what Jesus is saying about marriage, what He says is marriage is between a man and a woman. And when a man is grown up and is going to marry his wife, who does he leave? His father and mother. There's a lot said right there about marriage. He said marriage is for a man and a woman. And when they have kids, they are a father and a mother. That excludes everything else. Are there any other type of relationship? Two men, two women. That's excluded from all of this. And this goes all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, after... God created woman. He caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And Adam, while he is asleep, God took from him a rib and fashioned a helper for him. Adam woke up and said, This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother. A man shall leave his father and mother. And be joined to his wife. He makes it very clear who is under consideration in this situation from the very beginning. You might wonder where our scripture reading fits in. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there in verse 14. And notice what it says there. I 
know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. What God did was established forever. Think about that. Think about what what that text is telling us. And and when we look at Genesis chapter 2 and we go to Matthew chapter 19 and we see that Jesus is pointing out that from the beginning He made them male and female. Nothing can be added or taken away, the Ecclesiastes writer said. And so when we look at the subject, for example, of marriage, we can learn a lot about how marriage is to be between a man and a woman. And we can learn a lot about how marriage is not to be between two men and two women. No, it's not to be, but rather between a man and a woman. For example, think about the purpose of marriage. It can be summed up really in three, in three words, while there's probably more that we could talk about, we're going to talk about these three specifically. First of all, procreation. Second of all, illustration. Third of all, sanctification. Procreation, illustration, sanctification. Let's talk first of all about procreation. Because this is important for us to understand a little bit about what is being talked about. The idea of going forth and multiplying and having children in that relationship from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, after God created man and He he goes forth there and He tells them in Genesis 1 verse 28, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now he goes back in Genesis chapter 2 and he kind of gives a little bit more detail about how that was to take place. That a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That they are no longer two but one flesh. And they are to be fruitful and multiply and fill earth. The earth. Later in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, after the flood, Noah and his family is told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Even in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 13, there in verse 4, we're going to look at this text a couple of times in this lesson, but Hebrews 13, verse 4, the, the marriage bed is undefiled. Right? It is in marriage that this is to take place. This certain relationship is to take place. If homosexuals were left to themselves, they could not bear children. They could not multiply and fill the earth because they could not procreate. They could not have children. It's impossible for that to take place. Secondly, there's the illustration. We think about the illustration of marriage. Several things come to my mind. Uh, One of which is 1 Corinthians chapter uh, chapter 11, verse 3. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, he talks about there how Christ is the head of man and that the, 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 the head of the wife is the husband and God is the head of, the Father is the head of Christ. He's talking about headship. And he talks and he uses Mary, husband and wife, to illustrate the headship of Christ over the man and the Father over Christ. And so it illustrates that Headship in the relationship. Ephesians chapter 5 in verses 25 through 32, we also have it illustrating the relationship of Christ and the church. That just as husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her. 
how He cherishes and nourishes her and provides for her. And in verse 32 even, He says there, as He quotes from Genesis 2 and verse 24, For this cause a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, He says there, this is a profound saying, and I tell you it refers to Christ and the church. It describes that relationship that we are to have. And of course in sanctification. Marriage is something that that involves sanctification. Marriage is a relationship set apart by God Himself. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, in verses 13 and 14, for example, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 13 and 14, after he says that a woman is not to divorce her husband and that a man is not to divorce his wife, he goes on to talk about if a woman is married to an unbeliever and he wants to stay, then she should stay because they are sanctified. Even the unbeliever is sanctified in that relationship. If your translation uses the word holy, that's the same thing, set apart. They are set apart in that relationship. They are sanctified. And so are their children. That's what marriage between a man and a woman does. And again, Hebrews 13, in verse 4, the marriage bed is undefiled. It is within that marriage bed where those, that relationship is sanctified, is made holy, is right and not wrong between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. Listen, God is the author of our lives and of this world, not man. God defines marriage, not man. This is, of course, nothing new in our world and what we're going through in our culture, in our lives. This is something that they've been dealing with going all the way back. You can think about the, the judgment during the times of, of, of Abraham and Lot when, when judgment was brought against Sodom and Gomorrah. You can think about in the book of Leviticus after Moses delivered the children of Israel and they, as they were leaving Egypt and headed towards the promised land in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13 talking about the homosexual rel- relationship, talking about a man with a man and a woman with a woman, he says it is an abomination. And under the old law, they were to be put to death. It was an abomination. And when we look at the Scriptures... And we can look at the Scriptures as not just being different stories that have no uh, fluency whatsoever, but instead understanding that the Scriptures really are one fluid story that brings us to today. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so, when you hear these people saying terms like traditional marriage, that is the media that is simply promoting an agenda, trying to glamorize and glorify sinful behavior. In Romans chapter 1, in verses 26 and 27, he talks about those who would exchange the natural use of the man and the natural use of of the woman. Exchanging the natural use for what is not natural. And he goes on to say it's shameful and it's an abomination. He describes that relationship. and says it's wrong. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Now this is where it gets a little tricky. And this is some of the arguments that I want us to be clear on. I want want to read some passages, a couple of verses here. 
And then we're going to come back and we're going to look at this particular text. Because it's going to, in part, depend on the translation that you have. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Talking about those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. The New King James Version says there that fornicators are sexually immoral, adulterers, idolaters, homosexuals. Now, if you have the American Standard Version or the Old King James, instead of homosexuals, it says effeminate or abusers of themselves with men. The ESV says men who practice homosexuality. Now, why is that important to point out? Well, let, let's get a couple more verses here. Jude verse 7, first of all, talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, how they had indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires. When you go back and you study what was going on, you had men going after men in that text. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verses 10 and 11, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, it says there that fornicators... Sodomites, kidnappers, liars, and any other thing contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel. And we read these texts and, and we look at the word and the term sodomite and, and then we, we think about what was stated back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and we, we look at some of these other passages the argument is made that the word homosexual is never used in the Bible. Now some of you, if you have the New King James or the, Ameri uh, the English Standard Version, you look at it and say, wait a minute, it's, it's right there. No, actually it isn't. The word homosexual is not used in the Bible. That's actually a true statement. But I want, you, I want to explain this for just a minute. It's kind of like the word dinosaur. You know, people ask, why aren't there dinosaurs in the Bible? Why doesn't the Bible talk about dinosaurs? The word dinosaur was a word that was created in the 1840s. Before the 1840s, the word dinosaur did not exist in any language. What it describes certainly did. But the word itself was a word that was made up, created, and coined in the 1800s. You know, it's the same is true with the word homosexual. The word homosexual wasn't a word even in the English language prior to the 1800s. And it wasn't until the 1940s that it was put in any translation for the first time. What does that mean for us? It's a word. It's a word that describes certain things. And the Bible, while that word was not around to be used in the Bible, the Bible does describe that relationship. Back in Romans chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 28. It describes what was happening. And then they go and they look at that verse and said, well, the, the words there for men, one is older men and one is younger men. Older men with younger men. So now they're talking about age. They want to bring age into it. And yet with women, that's not the case. They're grasping at straws. They're trying to deny and justify their, their relationships or friends or family relationships. The Bible is clear that God and Christ, when He describes marriage, it is with a man and a woman. And when a man is about to get married, he leaves his father and his mother. 
not as two fathers, not as two mothers. And so that is the relationship described and set forth in Scripture. We go back to Matthew chapter 19 and verses 4 through 6. Again, have you not read that, in the, that God made them in the beginning male and female? Just a side note. You know, they say that, that the, 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 the body parts is not what determines sex. That's what they're arguing. And yet, what's the first thing they mutilate to try and, and, and change themselves to be what they feel like they ought to be? Isn't that kind of ironic? That's the part that they want to change? Why is that? It's because they, they are hypocritical in their arguments. By all means, what we find in the Scriptures is pointed out, as Jesus says, He made them male and female. For this cause a man should leave his father and mother, that they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. God will join together a man and a woman. They are bound together in marriage. Not two men, not two women, not a man claiming to be a woman or a woman claiming to be a man. God is clear when it comes to the family unit. And we've got to be, beware because they are trying in the world around us, in our schools and in our government, they are trying to indoctrinate our children. They are trying to, to ridicule and they're trying to, to bully Christians to accept sin, and deny truth. To accept sin and hate truth. But we've got to fight the good fight of faith. We must hate sin and love the sinner and share the gospel with everyone. Oftentimes, so many times I've been asked, would we welcome homosexuals here? At Southside, folks, everyone is welcome to come and join our services, to worship with us, to hear the gospel preached, because the gospel can change lives. The gospel is the power of God into salvation, Romans 1 verse 16. Can we accept fellowship with someone who continues in sin? Whether it's homosexuality or not, no. We cannot accept fellowship with some who, someone who continues to practice sin. But if they're willing to change, they're willing to hear the gospel preached, and they desire to seek the truth, yes, the best place for them to be is here. Invite your friends and family and your neighbors, and don't think for a moment because they're living a certain way that they're not willing to change or that the Word of God cannot change them because it can. If we're willing to speak out and be bold, we'll find those who are willing to listen and hear the truth and allow the truth to work on their hearts. It's not up for us to decide whether or not they will hear it and accept it. It's simply up to us to share it with them and help guide them along in the Scriptures as they go along their journey finding the truth and, and either accepting it or rejecting it. That's their choice to make. We invite everyone to come as they are, but leave as Christ is. Come with the idea that I'm willing to change and make the changes that are needed. And if you're here today and you desire to, to, uh, to change your life to a better life, a life of hope and joy and peace, looking forward to a home with God in heaven, you can repent of your sins, put the old person of sin to death, bury in the watery grave of baptism and rise to walk in newness of life. To make your life right with God, that is the call and the plea that we have for you today. Whatever changes are necessary, God can help you with those changes. And we as, as, as Christians can help you through the Scriptures as well. And if that's your desire and we can help, please don't delay. Come to the front. us together. We stand and sing.